so next, this is the last talk before our break. Uh, so this talk will be from 10 to 10.30 and we'll have a break. Uh, this talk is an R from which has been mentioned uh, several times this week already. Uh, Martin Rahm, who will be presenting Malcolm Pendle, uh, will also be here at the end for uh, Q&A. Uh, so Martin is, Martin Johnson are lead writers, um, who are not, and are uh, both senior engineers at this research. So that's the Martin, and the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Okay, a couple of uh, administrative pieces of information. So this is basically the, the, the first part in a, in a series of tutorials today. And the second and third, as we've already um, announced earlier, are both pre-registration fully and limited to even more one of them. Which yeah. might be exactly because I love talking about our talk, I love um, seeing people use it, I love to see uh, more people use it and teach them about it. But we just have limited space on hardware, so I'm really sorry about this. Um, but we'll, you know, we'll follow up, and that, there's not much we can do about it at this point. Um, okay, well, let's talk about RFNOC. So I've been talking about RFNOC for not only because I, I love the project, but also because there's just so much to say. So 30 minutes won't quite cut it, so I'm going to be very high level in this presentation. Um, just to give me an idea, so who has not? Heard about our at least knows what it does. So, for who, whom am I, am I addressing? Who, who this is very new? Right, there's actually very few, few set of hands. So I'm just gonna, I'm probably gonna breeze through the first couple of slides very quickly, to give the idea of what we're talking about, and then sort of try and spend more time on the actual concepts and the architectural overview. What I'm not doing on today on the stage is a demo for two reasons. First of all, um, we will do part of the tutorial, and then you're going to say, well, but that's not fair. I <laughs> managed to sign up. We also have a couple of demos tomorrow. Um, so we have two talks. So Jonathan and Sylvain will be talking about our talk, and we'll be showing some. So I thought it might be more useful today, but just focus on actual concepts. OK, so if you, just, if you only take away one slide, let it be this one. So this is a bit of a um, thing I sort of came up with, but it's a bit of a lie as well, but it's a useful one. Um, our talk is for FPGA is what can radios for GPPs. So um, what I don't want to imply is that there's some kind of competition between the two projects. They actually work very well together. But there's actually a lot of um, similarities between them. So you know, like in, in radio, you can set up new applications very easily and quickly, because all you have to do is fill out a work function, and you have a block, and you just drop it into your rest of the application, our flux sort of falls into the same you know, scheme of things. And then nothing that is sort of specific to um, data movement or management is, is something you need to worry about, both in our flux as well as in your radio. So all the, you know, all the boring things, um, you know, they're all done for you. You don't have to set up buffers in your radio, and you don't have to make sure the data gets made to be in our flux. And uh, in both cases, there's a couple of blocks already available that, that you can use, and you can sort of amend them. And I, I have to admit that on the Arfnox side, we're still at the beginning, so there's not quite as many as on the Kubernetes side. But it's not like there's nothing there right, right now. It's like, actually already starting to get to be useful. And um, both of them work with the Kubernetes companion, so I'm going to show that later. And I'm happy to hear all of your comments and criticisms of Arfnox. I think if we did one thing right, it was integrating it into the radio, making sure this projects uh, you know, work well together. Documentation-wise, you know, I always keep saying that the integrated documentation is much better than its reputation. Okay, I'm, I'm fibbing a little bit on the outside. We really don't have any documentation. <laughs> but um, really, so I mean, if I'd ask you, would you want me to sit down and write documentation next week? Um, I'm going to give you two reasons why I wouldn't do that. So because one, I couldn't work on an R flock, and then it might actually be outdated pretty quickly. Because this is something I like to emphasize. At this point, R flock is still not finished, so we will be changing, or we might be changing APIs. It's not like we want to do that just to annoy everyone, but um, if we feel it's necessary to like help the project, right now we're still in beta phase, so we'll just reserve the right to change stuff um, if, if we feel it will improve the impact. The only thing that neither our nor computer do is just actually write your SDR applications for you, and I don't think that'll ever change. Okay, so I'm just, this is sort of the motivation of why we did our in the first place, and as I said, I'm going to sort of 
breeze through these very quickly. Um, when did this all start? So here's a simple um, RFDM transmitter block, and it really implies that there's all this stuff going on on the left, and on the right hand side, we have this one monolithic block which sort of controls the user. But that's actually not the case. If you open an X300, when I say open X300, I mean look at the FPGA codes, or even just look at the schematics, um, there's another chain of signal processing blocks in, inside the FPGA, right? We have codecs, we have um, sample wave conversions, scaling, uh, front end correction, that kind of thing. And so really this should, shouldn't be, look like this. Really there should be you know, a series of blocks tuck, 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 that we can sort of individually parameterize from the degree of companion. And, um, but instead it looks like we have this, this white box over here that is sort of you know, fixed and you can just tell what to do but you can't really sort of have the same level of granular control over it as we do the software side. And um, really there's no reason to do there's no real reason why this is the case because um, all the USAP um, codes, they're all available. You know, it's not, it's not like we're hiding anything. It's not like we want to hide IP or something. It's, it's, it's just simply we didn't have the actual framework to, to do this. So um, why hasn't anyone written RFNOC before? Well, it's difficult um, for many reasons. Developing RFNOC itself is, is a lot of work, but also something Developing on FPGAs is something that is uh, it's not simple. Um, you need to know what you're doing. And there's, there's sort of two aspects of that. About this. One is the actual sort of digital design. And if anyone wants to develop on an FPGA, that will always be something that you have to understand. It's like writing C++ code, you have to know what a buffer is. If you want to write code for an FPGA, you need to know what a, I don't know, flip flop is or whatever. But there's also a lot of other things that you need to take care of when you're writing design for FPGA, that is, you know, the data movement and flow control and all of that gets taken away by our phone. And what we want is to have the same effect that Norega had where people that come from the DSP community, for example, they can just work with their problems, you know, their codes or DSP algorithms or whatever, whatever. They don't have to worry about all the rest and, you know, be more productive. And, um, very few people live in this middle part of the Venn diagram where they actually know everything. And Matt already alluded to this earlier um, yesterday, where he said, you know, years back, you had to know so many things to be effective in SDR, and um, sort of that's changed a lot, and we're trying to improve that even further. Okay, here's, a, here's a very good example of where our form would be really useful. So say you've done your DSP 101 class, and you've heard about spectral analysis, and there's Welsh algorithm, it's laid out right there in the textbook, and you think, oh, well, this is easy. I can just grab some blocks from the radio companion, throw them on the flow graph. There we go. It's all there, uh, ready to run. So you have, I don't know if you can read this from where you're sitting, but so this is our radio source. Then this is the first part of the process in the T. And uh, we, took, we take the magnitude square of that. We average it in, um, over, over vectors, and then we plot. And that is sort of our spectral estimate. Now, this has a couple of issues. First of all, we're doing all these things on the host, which are really, really well suited to be run on an FPGA, like FTs, magnitude square, averaging, very simple math operations, very, very highly parallelizable, perfect application for an FPGA. But we're doing them on the host. And on the flip side, the FPGA is basically underutilized. So on the next weekend, if you buy it right now, it has like 30% utilization. 70% of an FPGA that was not cheap are just sitting around and could be doing the work. But if you run this, you'll actually run into a more practical issue. Even if you have, even if you have a very high-end computer, oops, what did I do? Oh, thank God. Um, <laughs> look, this, this little arrow actually abstracts away a, uh, an, an Ethernet cable. So maybe you're using a 1 gigabit Ethernet cable, but you want to display 200 megahertz of real-time Spectrum because you've read the data sheet of the X300, and that's what you get. It doesn't actually work because um, if you do the math, 200 megahertz uh, samples, there's 800, um, was it 800 megabytes per second? Whatever it is, is much more than a gigabit Ethernet cable can carry. So there's a problem right there, even in a simple flow graph like this. So what's the goal? We, don't, we sort of want to make sure that this, this barrier here that sort of separates the hardware from the software that sort of gets taken away and can put it anywhere else, like here. And if we did this, then we would solve the problem, right? So FT, log logarithms, we just do all of it on the FPGA, then we can downsample and we just 
I'll put less data over the cable, this is played on a computer, and I have like very, very low CPU utilization, perfect, okay? And um, for us, a couple of other important goals were, well, obviously it should be easy to use, and it should sort of follow the same paradigm that Nvidia has, where you have lots of blocks, and the modular that work all together, and of course, we love Nvidia, and we want to make sure that this works with Nvidia. So our phenomenon is what we came up with, and um, what is our phenomenon? So, you know, the marketing thing would be something that makes FPGA development much easier, but sort of going a bit more technical, it is a um, infrastructure of the FPGA that we provide, where you sort of put in your own IP, I'll talk about that later. And also, importantly, um, uh, an updated software API that lets you control this all very easily from the host. Which also works if you do not use the radio. Um, this is what you get right now if you run our examples. So this is actually a flow graph that uh, Sylvain provided. Uh, this is the uh, RF not phosphor version that we've already heard about. And um, it looks very much, it looks very familiar. This is a flow graph, but there are some subtle differences. So you can see, maybe you can, I you can see it from where you're sitting there. These arrows are green. And these are black. And arrow colors are something that we sort of needed, and we worked together with Sebastian. We'd like to give a shout out to Integrate New Radio Companion. These are our, our block domains. So the yeah, RFNOP blocks live in a different domain than the Radio blocks. So green arrows um, uh, uh, stand for RFNOP connections, and black ones, as before, in the radio. We have these mixed ones, green, green and black dash. These are domain crossings. So you can see data is flowing from this block, through this block, through this block, through this block, and then they sort of cross over the radio domain, go into this um, display block, and then what we ha also have is a message interface that sort of loop loops back into this block that is somewhere in the middle. And that's kind of interesting. We have all the features of the radio, but we also get all the new features of our knock. There's really um, little trade-off here. So, uh, let's go into some some nitty gritty details here. So what happens if we sort of take that same application that I talked about earlier and put it into our clock, and then what happens under the hood? So first of all, if you run user of sources in your radio companion, you know they're called user of source or user of sync. And this one is called our clock radio. So there's already some difference here. So this is a block that controls the radio core on an X300 or E310. And um, we'll then stream data to whatever downstream block it is, what block you have. Well, what's happening on the FPGA uh, is we have this thing called the crossbar, where all blocks on one FPGA are connected to. And one of them is the radio block. So here, the radio core is called in this slide. So um, this new radio companion rectangle actually controls an FPGA core that is connected to the crossbar. And um, Somehow, magically, data will move to the next block. I'm going to tell you how that works very soon. So in this case, I've actually not fully gone through the, all the advantages of our So I'm only using the radio core of our but none of the downstream blocks. That means the radio core uh, on the FPGA, which talks to the ABCs and the DACs and also the um, you know, I2C or I2I interfaces with the thought boards, um, also settings for time commands, this kind of thing. <clears throat> it will receive data. The data goes to the crossbar, and the crossbar knows what to do with it. And it will pass it up to the next layer, which is the ingress, ingress interface. We'll talk about that too in a sec. And um, if, if we're using an X300, as I was talking about earlier, this will be a, um, this little arrow here will be a uh, Ethernet cable or PCIe connection. And UHD on the host side is able to receive this data and pass it on back to the radio. And then in the radio, it's, it's in the flow graph again, and same as we know before, as we've done before. Now the thing is, this crossbar has a couple of ports. So we have 16 ports per crossbar, the way we've implemented right now. And you can put your custom R car ports here. So this doesn't have to be empty space, um, it doesn't have to be a radio, it can be anything. And um, the radio is actually one of those blocks. It 
conceptually is not much different. There are some subtle differences, but um, it's not addressing a radio block and addressing any of these is um, basically the same operation. Now, um, in my example earlier, I said, well, we have an FFT. Oh, sorry, to turn off. <laughs> it reminds me to take a break every once in a while. <laughs> I think now would not be a good time. <laughs> I'm you excited. Um, so in my, in my earlier example, I had an FFT, and I said, this would be a perfect candidate to um, move to the FPGA. Well, yeah, why not? Let's put an FFT block where I had the uh, notification saying, where, where it said custom RF not block earlier. And then, like, the same way the radio um, block in the radio companion controls the radio core in the FPGA, this FFT core will control the FFT core. And um, just to update my little photograph, you can see here, here I was still using the radio FFT. I actually need to use a circuit block. It's not that I can just set a flag or something. It's this little you know, use the F FPGA side. We, ha we have to use, um, we have to use the radio that we want to use the r one. So we exchange that, and there we go. That's all we need to do. We connect the radio to the FFT, and there we are, to controlling the FFT one. And um, what happens now with the data? Now, this green arrow does not mean that actual data is flowing across it on the host, because that would be the whole purpose of r one. It sort of is a placeholder to say, okay, we've connected the radio to the FFT, which means we want the data to flow from here to there in whatever fastest way possible. <coughs> and what actually happens is the radio tells the radio core to actually to stream to the FFT, and there's an addressing uh, mechanism that we use to um, identify the data packets that go out of the radio core. So the radio will produce data and the cross by instead of sending it back to the host, will now send it to the FFT block. The FFT block needs to know that it's actually supposed to send data back to the host, and that's what it will do. Okay? So let's look into that um, data flow mechanism in detail. So um, inside these blocks, we have a couple of components that are common to all blocks. And these, this common infrastructure we call the knock shell. So the idea is that we provide you a shell, the knock shell, where you put in your IP, and um, you put in whatever you need to do. And on the radio uh, side of things, we need to connect to ADCs and DECs and setting purchases, that kind of thing. We need to also do um, front-end corrections, for example, for IQ balance. <coughs> on the FFT side, we, um, in this case, we actually just drop in a, a Xilinx FFT call from Quadjet. Very convenient. And uh, so what happens is um, the radio knows how to talk to the radio block knows how to talk to the, the physical radio. It'll get samples and it'll sort of packetize them into a format that we call C -Vita. We sometimes call it Cheddar. Um, the uh, C -Vita format includes a uh, includes 64 header bits, um, and these header bits include, for example, which block the data needs to go. It also includes a couple of other status bits and um, sequence numbers, that kind of thing. This is not the level of detail I wanted to go to in this talk, but you can ask me obviously afterwards. So um, the block needs knows. Okay, I've got a couple of samples, and I'm supposed to say produce packets of 300 samples, for example, or could be any other number. Maybe it's 128 because we have an FFT size of 128. So we package these samples, send them to the crossbar, put on the right address, and then the crossbar knows where to put the next data packet. Goes into the FFT, FFT calculates the FFT, and sends the next packet out, and in this case, it goes to the host. Yeah, so um, on this data path, so if you know anything about FPGAs, um, you'll know that it's important to sort of make sure that we have a clear path in here. So um, <coughs> what we're using here, for all these um, data flow buses as XEStream. So um, you know, this, this block might not be ready to accept the packet. Um, but we have a mechanism that's helpful control to make sure that this doesn't happen. Because if we if we sort of incorrectly send stuff to the crossbar that can be delivered anywhere, we'd be potentially able to lock up the X300 and then we have the power cycle. We don't want that. So um, this flow control um, 
is provided by Alpha, and it's usually not something you need to worry about. I've already mentioned that we use Axis Stream everywhere, and here we even provide a mechanism to connect um, any core, there's a sort of a standard 32-bit Axis Stream interface to our not shell, which is very convenient, for example, for the core gen um, blocks, because they, they have this interface. So to do the to drop in the FFT block from Xilinx, we needed to do very little because we not only have the knock shell, but we also have an um, interface that will allow us to connect the knock shell to the um, FFT block. And that means that it opens up a whole bunch of... Um, that means we... Um, you say I have five minutes left? Oh, I'll get you hurt. Um, <laughs> um, this means we already have a huge li library of block, um, you know, IP available in this group. Okay, so um, the crossbar deals with all of this, but one other thing I'd like to point out is that we can put these blocks into different clock domains. So if you have something like very complicated that needs to run at a lower clock rate, for example, you can do that. Um, yeah, ideally, all you need to do is drop your side right here. Okay. So um, we can have all kinds of blocks. That's important to point out. So um, you know, we just dropped in. I've been sort of dropping in little examples. I've been hiding them in the slides all the time, um, like crypto and demon. And we can put in. I like you to concentrate on this little block on the on the bottom right. Um, this is a, a micro um, little micro block. We can put in C code and then you know do protocol parts like that. And the difference between this and the grid block is. It makes uh, use of the low latency that we have on the FPGA side. So this would be something um, you know we could use for something where we need very fast responses. Okay, I'm going to have to hurry up here. But also in interesting to know is that whatever transport we have to the host, I mean, it could be DVD Ethernet, but on the Ethernet hand, it's actually a, an AXI bus. Um, <coughs> doesn't matter. Like for the block author, it's the same thing. So ideally, you can actually take your blocks from the H210, port them to the embedded devices, et cetera, et cetera. And um, last but not least, we also provide a lot of um, API capabilities on the UHD side to sort of set this all up very transparently. Uh, one thing that we have is um, a very easy way to map these settings and can really companion to registers. Um, we, call, we call them Oxford, and we're going to talk about that later. Oh, so yeah. That's our talk in a nutshell. Um, yeah, so this is sort of the tagline as it came up with while I was making slides. And the array of FPGA doesn't so say it's a useful lie, but I think um, you, you know what I'm trying to get there. Uh, trying to change my web. You know what I'm trying to get for this. Um, we have a couple of blocks available. Obviously, all of this is open source. You can download it from my GitHub, and um, yeah, and you can try it out, assuming you have the devices. Unfortunately, you still need um, science tools to build FPGA stuff. As I'm looking very much forward to a future where we have, you know, source FPGA development tools, but we don't have it right now. Um, if you want to try it out, you'll need an X310 or an E310. Um, you know, future products will also uh, have this, but as Matt mentioned yesterday, it's difficult to sort of plot this into, you know, start and six type of FPGA. Yeah, you can grab it all, and when you do, you can write a link to your radio, and um, try it out. So, thank you very much. And thank you. Thank you. So, you actually only used three minutes of your five. So <coughs> oh, okay. Uh, all right, so, uh, we have a few other questions. Uh, any questions from the audience? Yes, John. Hey Martin, great talk. Uh, what are the licensing implications for, I guess, ArcNOC, the the uh, you know the framework around it, and then the blocks themselves? So for like, we have IP blocks where we would be interested in plugging them in, but they're not necessarily open source. How does that play? I saw you mentioned like the the silence FFT core as well. Like, can you help me understand what the what's uh, what the options are there? Oh, all right, I. Is Matt here? <laughs> so, say you have Xilinx, so as far as I know, you can just go ahead and do whatever you want. UHP is, uh, um, if you just download it from our website, it's, it's UPL, and you can do whatever you like it. I don't know, but Manuel, do you have any insights? They click the license that you 
conflict with install of auto is not open source compatible. Well, yeah, that's true, but um, you're not actually writing software in Nevada that has to work um, in a link to other software. So I, I honestly, I, you know, I can't give you like a legal, correct answer to this question. It's, it's a big one. Um, is our not GPL, uh, like GPL v2, v3? Oh yeah, it's all it's all GPL v3. v3. Okay. But um, you know what the implications are of dropping in. Um, so for, for example, the designing is like a key part of the obviously not. Um, is, as far as I'm aware, that's that is not a problem. Okay. If using it for your own use is fine. If you were to actually put it and give it delivery to a customer, you probably need to talk about it, so some licensing rights. That's yeah. Right the first time. I I really can't give you the right answer to this question. So. You know, that is one of the reasons why, uh, for the tutorial later, people have to bring their own laptops. Right. And we can't just provide them with everything. Um, you know, we, we sort of done our best to make it as, as really available as possible. And then, other than that, we have to probably ask that. That's maybe one by the way, our director Mark. I was curious. Uh, yes, question. So last year I was a talk about um, Channelizer on the FPGA by Tadeus Kuhn, uh, I think. Uh, can you tell us how far are you away from building an, a channelizer or something like that into our uh, market? Sure. Uh, actually, I'll just pass it on to Jonathan and Yale. So if you look in the RF map, um, in FDK repository, you'll actually see that there is a polyface filter bank block there. Um, it hasn't been fully tested yet, but it's we're in the process of doing that, so we're getting closer and closer. It's fine not that far off. And just to um, add to that, um, we, we know that our fault right now doesn't solve the need of doing that, building a channel license. And that goes for most other DSP functions that we can think of. So uh, we obviously have to implement everything that you can implement, because you know, that would take forever. Um, but you know, channel life would be interesting, so we'll be providing that as an example. But you can think of other things, timing loops or killers, that we might, you know, that are too specific that we might not be able to provide, but we know that our flock in our flock infrastructure is capable of doing that. A question? Uh, ben. Yes. Do you plan it? Eric, yeah. Are you planning on having equivalent for tagging or messages? Tagging or messages? Okay, so um yeah, yes and no. Um, actually, so the, the thing is, um, any metadata, metadata you want to pass between blocks has to go into the same payload. So what you can do on the um, PA side or wherever, is you sort of define packets and say, okay, like my first n bytes are metadata and the rest is payload. Um, I've actually thought about putting that into Conrado. Into, so I didn't talk about this, but we have a module called GRS that sort of talks between, you know, does the translation. And I've actually thought about making that sort of just a, a, a parameter. Um, there are a couple of tags that already work, so the end of verse tag. And as a matter of fact, um, well, Sylvain and Jonathan have been using the end of verse tag for something else than end of verse, because they, they just need the tag at a certain point, and then they just look for the end of verse tag because they know what it means. Um, so messages, on the other hand, um, our talk doesn't necessarily have to stream continuously, so you could actually just have like a burst the interface. That would be the same as a message interface. With the difference that you sort of have to agree beforehand what your message format is. Unless you have a way of, of serializing stuff into a, into a packet, like, that would also work. So um, because the whole data transport um, par paradigm is different, there's really, like if you had messages in our flock, they would basically be the same as, as any other type. Okay, um, any other questions? We have a question here. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to ask them. I can see out loud, I guess. Uh, is it possible to do a pipelining with this at my block level, or I need to uh, output a block before receiving more data? I'm just going to let Jonathan answer this. Uh, Jonathan, let me give you a here. What was the question? Yeah, can you, uh, can you repeat the question as well? Okay. <laughs> I was just wondering if I was able to do pipelining at my block level, or if my block 
that actually have to output the data before receiving more. So when you say pipeline, like you're able to stream data through it continuously? Yep. So that's a nice thing about um, one of the slides that Martin showed is it was showing at the kind of drill down detail level where there's this sort of vice mode, vice mode interface and talk about flow control. That's where you have that streaming capability. Is you'll have a FIFO that you can send data continuously or maybe in bursts, but at, behind the scenes it's sent out packetized. And as long as you make sure that you don't have a faster rate than what, say, the cross market support, which is very unlikely because of the widths and everything, um, it'll just work out of the box. Thank you. Okay, I, I'm afraid we're out of time for questions. Uh, you're welcome to follow up with Martin and Jonathan afterwards, I'm sure. Um, Martin, do you have anything else? Nope. Thanks for listening. Thanks for thanks for attending. Uh,